Now, oh, now I am. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. My name is Melissa Hart, and I'm the director of the Byron R. White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law at CU Law School. Um, we started this event last year, the Stevens Lecture, as an opportunity to bring a distinguished member of the ju judiciary to Colorado to give a public talk about judging and the state of the judiciary. We're honored this year to have Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as our second speaker in the series. Before I turn things over to Justice Ginsburg and to Dean Weiser, uh, Dean Phil Weiser, the Dean of the Law School, I have a couple of things I want to say about the White Center and then a little checklist of things I'm supposed to tell you. Um, one of the big focuses of the White Center in the past couple of years has been to really move the conversation about the Constitution outside of the academy and more into the public. Um, we've been doing that through a series of programs and on the back of your programs here today, you'll see a list of some of the events we have coming up this fall. I'd love to see you at those events. I also want to specifically mention that this week is the week of Constitution Day. Constitution Day is September 17th. Uh, and we started last year a project that sends law students into high schools to teach a constitutional lesson plan during the week of Constitution Day. This year it expanded to include not only law students but also uh, local attorneys, both alumni and others who volunteer through the Colorado Bar Association, and several faculty members who chose to volunteer this year. We have 80 students, about 30 lawyers, um, and several faculty members, and we've been in, or will be in by the end of this week, 112 classrooms around the state of Colorado. Uh, we're really trying very hard to make this an outreach for the whole state of Colorado, not just the metro area. I was actually in Glenwood Springs this morning teaching uh, in a, to a group of classes there. And that's similar also to this lecture, the Stevens Lecture. And I want to note that not only is the group of people in this room participating in this conversation, we also have overflow seating at the Wolf Law Building, where this lecture is being live streamed. And we have live streaming at Colorado College in Colorado Springs, at Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction, and at Fort Lewis College in Durango. And in all three of those outstate venues, we're live streaming and giving them the chance to ask questions. They're emailing them to us, and they will be included on the list of questions that will be asked of Justice Ginsburg. So we're really trying to bring these conversations around the state of Colorado. So that's enough about the White Center. Um, the details that I need to mention to you, um, the people with cameras, most of them seem to be right here. Um, we can't have flash photography, so that's the audience and also the media. And then I also wanted to ask if you could remember to turn your phones off. Um, it would be really unfortunate if phones were ringing during the lecture. Um, and then finally, it was a, a big but really successful effort to get all of you into this room. Um, getting out will be, have its own logistical complications. When the lecture is over, if you could um, head out of the building and really keep on going out of the building. Don't stop in the hallway. Um, <laughs> Because getting 1,100 people out of that little space will, will take some effort and, and all of our cooperation. So with that, I'm turning things over to Phil Weiser. And again, thank you so much for being here. So there's a great Yiddish expression, which is, let me say a few words before I speak. <laughs> and in this case, those few words are to thank so many people. I want to start with the chancellor of our Boulder campus, Phil DiStefano, who has been incredibly supportive of the law school. And we're so grateful to have you here, Phil. Thank you for all your support. We have several regents here, members of the Board of Regents, two of whom are grads of our fine law school, Michael Kerrigan and Jonah Goose. And Irene Greco is here, too, I believe. Um, and if any of the regents are here, we thank you for all your support and your spirit. We do very much believe in engaging with the community, and we want to continue to do so in many ways. So I would echo what Melissa Hart said, and very importantly, acknowledge her leadership. In terms of the energy she's brought to the White Center, this Stevens Lecture was her brainchild. The Constitution Day activities were her brainchild. And recognizing that, I know the Board of Regents has recognized this, 
the uh, Chase Award given from the President's Office was given to Melissa Hart for her leading work in community service. So I want to acknowledge Melissa Hart. And finally, all of you make such a difference to us. When I think about what makes us successful as a law school, having a diverse, inclusive, and collaborative community of outstanding students, faculty, staff, alums, and friends gives us a fabulous advantage. The members of the judiciary here today, and there are several very supportive alums, professors, this community can come together and really make a difference, and you all matter in so many ways, so I want to thank all of you. I can't name you all, but you really helped make us special and successful. Now, when Justice Ginsburg agreed to come, she said, I don't want to give a lecture, but I would like a fireside chat. And I said, that would be lovely, and then gave myself the challenging assignment of coming up with a plan for our conversation. It was easy to know where to start, which is what a pioneer you have been. And many people here forget that in the 1950s there were very few women in law school. If you might start by reminding those who remember and helping to enlighten those who don't, what that was like. In those ancient days, I entered law school in 1956 when women were perhaps 3% of the lawyers in the country, no more. No woman sat on any federal court of appeals. There had been only one in history when Franklin Delano Roosevelt appointed Florence Allen from Ohio to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals when she left. There were none until Shirley Hofstetler in 1968. So in the years when I was going to law school, no women on any federal court of appeals, of course, none on the Supreme Court. I had no woman teacher that was unheard of. What was law school like in the not so good old days? Well, my entering class numbered over 500 and of those, nine were women. How did we feel? Well, we thought all eyes were on us, so we better be prepared because if we weren't, it would reflect not only on ourselves but on all women. To see the difference, I will tell you about a colleague of mine at Columbia Law School. Now, many years later, it's the mid-70s, and women are in law school in numbers. And this great professor said, I think it's great that we have so many women students, but I have a certain longing for the way it was. <laughs> when the class was moving slowly and you needed a crisp, right answer, you called on the woman. She was always prepared. <laughs> she would give you the right answer, and then you could move on. Well, nowadays, there's no difference. <laughs> the, women, the women are as unprepared <laughs> as the men. One final note. Uh, the law school that I attended had two teaching buildings. Only one of them had a women's bathroom. So if you were in class and you had to leave, well, you might miss some of the professor's pearls. But if you were taking an exam, time-pressured exam, in the building without the bathroom and had to make a mad dash to the other building, but the, the thing that I marvel at now is that we never complain. That's just the way it was. So when you graduated law school, you faced the challenge of finding a job, something our students here are uh, mindful of. You had what you might call a um, trifold challenge. 
firms often didn't hire Jews. Firms were certainly skeptical of hiring women, and you were also a mother. So how did that job search proceed, and how did you get your first break? Well, that's the, those were my three strikes. <laughs> there was no Title VII. I graduated in 1959. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawed discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, religion, and sex. But in the 1950s, law firms and some of the finest judges were up front in saying they wanted no women. They would feel uncomfortable dealing with a woman. Or, as I often heard, we hired a woman at this firm once, and she was dreadful. <laughs> How many men did they hire who didn't work out? So it wasn't easy to get that first job. The first job was all important, because if you got it and performed well, then the next job was secure. Well, I had a great professor. Some of you may know his name, Gerald Gunther. He was a great constitutional law scholar. And he was in charge of getting judicial clerkships for Columbia Law stu School students. And I was his special cause. He was determined to get me a federal clerkship. So he recommended me to a judge who always hired his law clerks from Columbia. And I said, my candidate for you this year is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And the judge said, well, I've looked at her resume. She has a four-year-old daughter. How can I rely on her? And the great professor said, Judge Palmieri, give her a chance. If she doesn't work out, there's a man in her class who will step in and take over for her. That's the carrot, the stick. If you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia clerk to you. <laughs> now that's how I got my first job, but it was it. <laughs> It was at least a paying job. Um, Justice O'Connor, who graduated from law school maybe five or six years before I did, very high in her class at Stanford Law School, no one would hire her. So she volunteered to work for a county attorney free for four months and said, if you think I'm worth it at the end of four months, you can put me on the payroll. That's how she got her first job. For those who um, are not aware, Justice O'Connor is coming next year to give the Stevens Lecture. And I'll be interested to hear her tell that uh, story <laughs> with maybe a little more flavor. Um, speaking of flavor, your husband, Marty, um, of blessed memory, was someone who was extraordinary on many, many levels. He supported your career and is quoted as saying that his greatest single accomplishment was supporting you. He also, in slightly more Marty um, humorous fashion, said, I learned very early on in our marriage that Ruth was a terrible cook <laughs> and for lack of interest was unlikely to improve. <laughs> so he said, out of self-preservation, I decided I had better learn to cook. You've talked about this a lot, but I, particularly the students in the audience, would like you to mention a few words about what it meant to have Marty as, as your life partner. Well, I was blessed for 56 years, married to a man who thought my work was as important as his and who was a great chef. <laughs> and our arrangement in our early years was that I would do the everyday cooking, and Marty would do the weekend and company cooking. When my daughter was about 14, 15 in high school, she noticed an enormous difference between mommy's cooking and daddy's. <laughs> So she decided mommy should be phased out of the kitchen 
entirely. Since 1980, when I got my first good job in D.C. on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, I have not cooked a meal. <laughs> um, my, my daughter, because she takes responsibility for keeping me out of the kitchen, she comes once a month. She's, she has inherited her father's talent. She's a fine cook. She comes once a month, and she cooks for me, fills the freezer, and then comes back the next month. This time, she outdid herself. She was with me at Labor Day week, and she made 48 individual meals for me to enjoy. There's a tribute to Marty. I think he would have liked it beyond anything else. It's a book. It's the best-selling book in the Supreme Court gift shop. It's called Supreme Chef, and it's a collection of 32 of Marty's many, many recipes. It was put together by the wives of the justices. The justices' spouses meet quarterly, and they rotate catering responsibilities. And Marty was always the favorite uh, caterer. And so uh, Martha Ann Alito, Justice Alito's wife, said, let's, let's make a cookbook, and we'll call it Supreme Chef, and it will be Marty's recipes, which he had on a disc. I think he wrote the recipes with me in mind because not, nothing is left out. There is not a mistake that you can make if you follow <laughs> his instructions. Anyway, before each section, before the orders, the soups, one of the, the Supreme Court spouses writes her memories of Marty, and it starts with Maureen Scalia, and it is very well illustrated. And then when, when this book was first in the gift shop, they ordered only a thousand copies. They thought it would be for in-house. Nina Totenberg then did a piece on it for NPR. And by that afternoon, I think she was on about 9 in the morning, by 3 o'clock, they had 3,000 orders. And so now they have a goodly supply. Speaking of Marty and your joint enterprise together, there's a fabulous story about your experience as a mother and your son James's experience in a New York City private school and how they related to you and to Marty. Could you retell that story? This is in the 70s. My child, I called him lively. His teachers called him hyperactive. <laughs> and, and I could expect a call once a month to tell me about my child's latest escapade, to come down to see the room teacher or the school psychologist or the principal. And one day, when I was particularly weary, I was sitting in my office at Columbia Law School, and I said, this child has two parents. Please alternate calls. <laughs> And it's his father's turn. <laughs> well, Marty went down from his office and went to the school, and he faced three stone faces. And what was James's crime? Your son stole the elevator. And so Marty's response was, how far could he take it? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it was Marty's humor, but I, su I suspect it was. When, this, when the school had to alternate calls, calls came barely once a semester. Now, there was no great improvement in my young son's behavior. But I think people were much more reluctant to call a man away from his work than a woman. So. 
You obviously are conscious of your special role as a woman on the Supreme Court, and three weeks after you had surgery, you went to the State of the Union because you said you wanted the country to see there was a woman on the Supreme Court. When you joined the court, Sandra Day O'Connor had been the only woman for some time, and you became two. After she left, you went back to having only a single woman, and now there are three. Could you reflect some on the dynamics at the court in terms of what it means to have a woman or more than one woman? Sandra was alone on the court for 12 years. And by the way, when I showed up and three weeks after pancreatic cancer surgery, it was nothing compared to Sandra was on the bench nine days after her breast cancer surgery. In any case, we belong to the National Association of Women Judges, and they knew just what would happen when I got there, number two. So they had a reception at the court in our honor, and they presented us with T-shirts. And Sandra's read, I'm Sandra, not Ruth. Mine, <laughs> I'm Ruth, not Sandra. <laughs> and nevertheless, Every term that the two of us sat together, one lawyer or another would address me as Justice O'Connor. <laughs> the people who know us know that we don't look anything alike <laughs> and we don't speak alike, but it was a woman's voice and the woman was Justice O'Connor. People like our Solicitor General, a former associate of mine at the ACLU, Then I was there all alone, and how did it feel? Lonely. It was the wrong perception for people to see just a little woman and eight larger men. But now, if you come to the court, I mean, you really should. We are all over the bench. Because of my seniority, I, I sit toward the middle. Justice Kagan is on my left end, and Justice Sotomayor on the other. And no one has called me Justice Kagan. No one has called Justice Kagan <laughs> Justice Sotomayor. These young, by my standards, women are not shrinking violets. They are very active in questioning it at oral argument. So. Now the perception is, yes, women, women are here to stay. And when I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough? And I say, when there are nine. People, <laughs> people are, are shocked. But there have been nine men, and nobody, nobody's ever raised a question about that. So on the less bright side, you remark when you were a younger lawyer, you would often say something. It would be ignored then a male colleague might say the same thing, and people would say, wow, what a great idea. Does that ever still happen to you? And can you reflect on why inclusiveness in our society, um, be it gender or race, is still such a continuing challenge? It doesn't happen now only because of the, the very good job that I have. There are only nine of us. And when I speak, my, my colleagues listen just as I listen to each of them. But that experience, women of my generation, all of them have had. When a woman spoke, it was time to tune out. She was not going to say anything very important. But most of that, I think, is, is gone today. The challenge of gender discrimination is one that you spent a lot of your career fighting. And it's interesting to look at the arc of Chief Justice Rehnquist's views on this topic. When you argued before the court and he was on it, he reportedly said, you, that you won't settle then for putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar, would you? As victory in the overall effort. 
He later joined your opinion, United States versus Virginia, calling for women to enter the Virginia Military Institute. And he also wrote the landmark Nevada versus Hibbs case, concluding that the Family Medical Leave Act would apply to state employers. When you think about the overall evolution of this doctrine, and you look at his evolution, how do you explain it? Let me go back to the case you first mentioned. It was my last argument before the court. It was in the fall of 1978. It was a case about putting women on juries. It isn't all that long ago that many states either didn't put women on juries at all, allowed them to sign up if they wanted to serve, or had an opt-out system that is an exemption for any, any woman. This case was of the latter kind. It was from the state of Missouri. And the clerk in Kansas City would send out notices for jury duty. And then the notice would say, if you are a woman, you are not required to serve. If you don't wish to serve, check off here. If no card was returned, the clerk would assume that the woman didn't want to serve with the result that there were almost no women on Kansas City, Missouri juries. So this was at a time when most states had changed. There were just a few holdouts, Tennessee, Missouri. Um, and I had a precious 15 minutes to argue. I divided the argument with the public defender from Kansas City. I spoke second, and when, when I was done, about to sit down, satisfied that I, I got out the major points I wanted to make, and then, then Justice Rehnquist, he was not yet chief, said that, so you won't settle for Susan B. Anthony's face on the new dollar. This is the same man that when I joined the court, and my commission was going to be presented by Janet Reno. Most attorneys general like to be called general. Janet said, I am not a general. I am Ms. Reno. Well, the chief wasn't so accustomed to using Ms. He knew Miss, and he knew Mrs. And he wanted to make sure that he could say it smoothly. So we had kind of a dress rehearsal before we went in. He said, Ms. Reno, Ms. Reno, three times. <laughs> we really cared about getting, getting it right. Then in the VMI case, Phil, he, he didn't join my opinion. He jo did join the judgment with the result. This was about admitting women to the Virginia Military Institute, a facility that the state of Virginia operated for men only and had nothing comparable for women. So it, it, it wasn't a case about separate schools. The women colleges, most of them were on our side. The idea was that the state cannot make an educational opportunity available for one sex only. In any event, the chief joined the judgment and that left Justice Scalia as the lone dissenter in the VMI case. Now the Hibbs case about the Family Medical Leave Act and the chief's understanding that it was important not to make this a maternity leave, that it should be part of a worker's life when you have a sick child, a sick spouse, a sick parent, you can take time off without putting your job in jeopardy. Well, I'd like to say that that I had something to do with the chief's education, but I don't think that's true. I think the cases that came before the court influenced him. But most of all, I think he was influenced by his granddaughters. One of his daughters was divorced, and she had two girls. And the old chief kind of took responsibility for being a male parent figure for those girls. They loved him. 
and I think he, he thought about how the, he would like the world to be for them. When you think about this evolution, starting really with Reed versus Reed in 1971, which was a case involving an Idaho probate law that said males must be preferred to females in appointing state administrators, up to VMI 25 years later, it's quite a movement in the court's position. You literally were there at every step of the way. With respect to that first step in Reed versus Reed, could you relate how you got involved in that case? Reed is a good example of that series of cases because they were all genuine. There were no test cases in the sense that they were set up by uh, any, any organization. Sally Reed was a woman from Boise, Idaho. She and her husband had a son. They separated. And Sally was given custody of the boy when he was, quote, of tender years. Then the boy reached his teens, and the father said, I should spend time with him. And the family court judge said, I suppose so. Now he needs to be prepared for a man's world. Sally thought that the father's home was not a good place for their son to be. But the judge made the decision he did. The boy was severely depressed and one day took one of his father's many rifles and killed himself. So Sally wanted to be appointed administrator of the boy's estate, not, not because it had any value, it didn't, but for sentimental reasons. The Idaho law at the time read, as between persons equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, males must be preferred to females. Now, Sally Reed took that case with her own lawyer from Boise, Idaho, through three levels of the Idaho courts. And then when a colleague of mine read the report of the Idaho Supreme Court's decision in the Journal for Lawyers, Law Week, he said, this is going to be the turning point case for gender in the Supreme Court. And he was right. Sally Reed won a unanimous judgment. The court pretended not to be doing anything new. But if you look back even to the, quote, liberal Warren court, 1961, the court decided a case called Hoyt v. Florida. Gwendolyn Hoyt was the petitioner. She was what we would today call a battered woman. One day, her philandering husband had humiliated her to the breaking point. She spied her young son's baseball bat in the corner of the room. With all her might, she brought it down on her husband's head. He fell to the floor, and that was the end of the argument and the end of the husband and the beginning of the murder prosecution. So Gwendolyn Hoyt thought, if there were women on the jury, they might better understand her state of mind. And even if they didn't acquit her of the murder charge, they might come in with a verdict for the lesser included offense of manslaughter. She was convicted of murder by an all-male jury, and when the case came to the Supreme Court, the unanimous Warren Court said, we don't understand what this complaint is about. Women have the best of all possible worlds. They're not on the jury rolls, that's true. But if they want to serve, they can for the asking. All they have to do is go to the clerk's office and sign up. 
Well, think of how many men would sign up if they didn't, didn't have to. I mean, it was Gwendolyn Hoyt told this and being just dumbfounded that they didn't understand her plight. That was in 1961, the liberal Warren Court. Ten years later, Sally Reed's case came before the, quote, conservative Bur Burger Court and a very different response. So during your time when you were litigating cases, and this comes really a question from Colorado Mesa University, did you have any trials where you got involved at the trial level? Or if you only did the appeals, um, might you, in either case, talk a little about the difference between trial work and appeal work? There were some cases that I started at the ground floor and took all the way up. Stephen Weisenfeld's case was one such case. But our cases were not the kind of dramatic trials that you might watch on, on, on television. They all presented a constitutional question. So let me talk about Stephen Weisenfeld's case which we brought in the Federal District Court in New Jersey. This was a man who, whose wife was a math teacher in high school. She had a healthy pregnancy. She remained in the classroom till the ninth month. She went to the hospital to give birth and the doctor came out and said, Mr. Weisenfeld, you have a healthy baby boy, but your wife died of an embolism. Well, Stephen Weisenfeld was determined that he would not work full time until his child was in school full time. He would earn the minimum that he could make and combine with social security benefits, make a living for himself and his infant son. And when he went to the Social Security office, they, they, they said, we're very sorry, but these are mother's benefits. They're not available. They're, they're available to widowed mothers, but not widowed fathers. I came to know about Stephen's case when he wrote a letter to the editor of his local newspaper. And he said, I've been hearing a lot of talk about women's lib. This is what happened to me. How does that fell in, fit in? Tell, tell my story to Gloria Steinem. <laughs> so at the time I was teaching at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, someone in the Spanish department came from the same town and she read this letter and she said, that's wrong, isn't it? And I said, well, why don't you suggest to Stephen Weisenfeld that he contact the American Civil Liberties Union? And that's how we, we started his case in, in the district court. It wasn't a question of putting on evidence. The facts were all undisputed, but of arguing the point that this law, which was described as beneficial to women, after all, widows got the benefits, disadvantaging only men, that all such laws, the root of the discrimination is against the woman. Here was Paula Weisenfeld, who paid social security taxes just like the rest of us, but they didn't gain for her family the same protection as the family of a male wage earner who had paid into social security. So the the discrimination begins with the woman and then the man because he is his role as parent rather than breadwinner doesn't get the benefits. There was a unanimous judgment of the Supreme Court in that case and by the way we got it from the district court from the court of first instance to the Supreme Court before Jason Paul Weisenfeld, before he reached his third birthday, and that is record speed 
for, for federal litigation. Anyway, the court reached a unanimous judgment but divided three ways. The majority thought it discriminated against the woman as wage earner, the very argument I just presented. Three thought it discriminated against the male as parent. And one said, I see this from the vantage point of the baby. It makes no sense that the child should have the opportunity for the personal care of a sole surviving parent, only if that parent is female, not if that parent is male. Yeah. Other, other cases that I was involved in from the ground floor was dealing with, uh, the, I call it the pregnant problem. Uh, into the early 70s, if a woman taught in a public school and she began to show, could be somewhere between four and six months, she was put on what was euphemistically called maternity leave. It was unpaid leave. She had no right to return. The school district would call her if and when they wanted her. And one of the reasons for this policy was, after all, we don't want the children to think that their teacher swallowed a watermelon. <laughs> then there were a whole series of cases involving women in service. If you were a woman in service, Pregnancy was considered, it was called a moral uh, or administrative ground for immediate discharge. So we have that. An another type of case, uh, a woman who had a blue collar job wanted to get health insurance for her family. The, her employer had a better package than her husband's employer. So she said, I'd like family coverage. And it, her supervisor said, well, I'm sorry. Family coverage is available only to men. Women can get single coverage, but men are the ones who have to cover the family. So in all these cases, you can see what's at work. The woman is seen as someone who is at most a secondary pin money earner. The man is the breadwinner who counts. So when the man steps out of his proper role as breadwinner and wants to take care of a baby, the law was not there to protect him. And similarly, the woman who wants essentially to get equal pay doesn't because she is considered uh, not the real breadwinner in the family. So like the Weisenfeld case, you brought a number of cases where it were the, the men who were suffering based on the distinction. Can you talk about what drove that decision and why you chose that strategy? The first case in that series was the Weisenfeld case. And, and so the benefits, the Social Security benefits he sought were child and care benefits. Then there was the same differential for uh, on retirement. Uh, a woman could get benefits for herself and not for her spouse. Or when she, when she died, old age and survivor's insurance, the man it could not collect as survivor. So, after the Weisenfeld case was won, we brought a series of cases to end all those gender lines in the, in the Social Security law. Perhaps I should say something about how I stopped using the term sex and started using the word gender, and it was in the Weisenfeld case. I had a great secretary at Columbia Law School who was typing my briefs, and she said, I'm typing these briefs and all over the word sex is sticking out. Don't you know that the first association of that word is not what you want those judges to be thinking about? 
also use gender. It's a nice grammar book term. It will ward off distracting associations. <laughs> But it, the, the, the message that we were trying to get across is that when you pigeonhole people on, on grounds of race, religion, whatever, and you not, don't let them be free to be you and to be me, as there's a wonderful song by um, Mar Marla Thomas. Uh, that people should not be held back by man-made laws from using whatever God-given talent they have. That girls as well as boys should be free to aspire and achieve. Well, what is interesting to think about this revolution of the gender discrimination doctrine is it takes root in 1971 with Reed versus Reed, over a hundred years after the Equal Protection Clause that forms the foundation of this doctrine was adopted. As a instructive case study in constitutional law, what lessons do we get from looking at this doctrine that didn't come around until after a hundred years based on the underlying constitutional text how does that speak to issues around originalism or jurisprudence? Well, first, you know that the original Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, in the original Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the word equal never appears. And to some people, that's startling because, after all, the Declaration of Independence, that was the motivating idea that all men are created equal. Why wasn't the word equal included in the original Constitution? For an obvious reason. It was the odious practice of slavery. That's why we don't get the equality principle written into the Constitution until the 14th Amendment, one of the three post-Civil War amendments. And it says in grandly general terms, nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Well, the reaction to that was everyone knows that the equal protection clause is about racial segregation, racial discrimination. It is, has nothing to do with, with women. And if you ask the framers of the 14th Amendment, did they think that that meant that women would have the right to own property in their own names, contract in their own names, sue and be sued in their own names? They would probably certainly not, say certainly not. Were they here today? I think they would agree that the idea of equality has growth potential, and it was meant to have growth potential to keep up with society as it changes from generation to generation. So the, one of the earliest arguments that was made was in the 1870s by a woman who, who, who thought that, well, she's a citizen, she should exercise the most basic right of citizens, she should be able to vote. So she invoked the Equal Protection Clause and the court said, of course, women are persons. We agree with you. Nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. Women are persons. But so too are children. And no one would think children should have the right to vote. That, that was the attitude in the, in the 1870s. I think the idea of equality and appreciation that 
racial discrimination, holding people back because of who they are and not what they can do um, is, is not compatible with a society that truly believes in the equality principle. So it was in World War I, you know, we went into World, uh, World War II. World War II, we went into World War II with segregated troops. We were fighting a war against racism, and yet our armed forces practiced racial discrimination. It was the awakening in the Second World War, I think. First to the problem of apartheid in America, and then to the notion that all people should have the opportunity to aspire, achieve, to be whatever they have the ability and will to do. So I think the people who wrote the Equal Protection Clause would probably say, yes, in the 21st century, it certainly includes, we meant it to include people who were once left out. I mean, other people who were left out, Native Americans, were not considered citizens. So a student, high school student in the auditorium, follows up that by asking about the rights of gays and lesbians under the Equal Protection Clause and how their issues um, are likely to uh, follow a similar arc. Do you see that similar dynamic playing out in that context? Bill, you know that that question runs up against the so-called Ginsburg rule, <laughs> which is when I um, was before the Senate Judiciary Committee, my rule was you can ask about anything I've written, about any of the hundreds of decisions I wrote when I was a judge on the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, but you can't ask me a question about an issue that is likely to come before the court. And I think everybody knows that not so long ago, Congress passed a law called the Defense of Marriage Act, which says marriage is between a man and a woman. And if you come from a state that recognizes same-sex marriage, like Massachusetts, like New York, no other state has to recognize that marriage, and it won't be recognized for any federal purposes, for example, so Social Security. There has been a challenge to the constitutionality of that act. The Court of Appeals for the First Circuit held it unconstitutional. A petition for review has been filed in the Supreme Court we haven't acted on it yet, but it would be extraordinary for the court to be asked to consider the constitutionality of a law passed by Congress that a lower court had held unconstitutional. So I think it's most likely that we will have that issue before the court toward the end of the current term and then the person who, have, who asked the question will have the answer. <laughs> Another question comes from the CU Auditorium. The Liddy, Lily Ledbetter case was one where you wrote a very emotionally charged dissent that you, if I recall, read from the bench, which is a rare act. Can you just reflect on that and also how it felt to have literally your request in the dissent that it's up to Congress answered in the Ledbetter Act passed and I believe the first law that President Obama signed. I should perhaps preface my answer by saying that when an opinion is ready to be released, the author of the majority opinion will summarize the decision from the bench. 
certainly not read every word of the often long op opinions. And then we'll note at the end, just as so-and-so has filed this dissenting opinion, period. So dissents ordinarily are not summarized from the bench unless you feel that the court not only got it wrong, but egregiously so. And that was what I thought in, in the Lily Ledbetter case. I think most of you have heard about this case. Lily Ledbetter was an area manager for a Goodyear tire plant in Gadsden, Alabama. And she was the lone wo woman in such a position at that plant. When she was engaged in the 1970s, she got the starting salary for people in that position. But over the years, her pay slipped in re relation to her male peers. Whether she suspected it, well, she didn't want to be known as a troublemaker. And then one day, when she was close to retirement age, one of her coworkers put a slip in her box. It said her salary, then it gave the salary of all the men doing the same job. She was getting 13 cents on the dollar less than the most junior occupant of the same position. So she, she brought a complaint under Title VII. She had a jury trial and won a sizable verdict. The decision was upheld on appeal to the Court of Appeals. And then the Supreme Court said, Ms. Ledbetter, you sued too late. Don't you see the law says you have 180 days from the discriminatory incident to file your lawsuit. 180 days from the first time her pay slipped. Well, women who are breaking new ground don't want to rock the boat. They also know that if they sue that early on, the defense will be had nothing to do with her being a woman. She just didn't perform as well as the men. When year after year she gets good performance ratings, and even an award as one of the top performers, that defense is no longer available. Also, employers, many employers, do not give out salary figures, so how would she even know? Her view, which I fully shared, was that every time she got a paycheck in which her salary reflected discrimination, every month the discrimination is renewed. And so she would have 180 days from each paycheck to begin her lawsuit. The experience that Lily Ledbetter had is, is something common to women of her generation, of my generation. Um, and yet, the court interpreted this 180 days to run from the very first incident of discrimination. And she didn't sue then, and too bad. My dissent said basically, Congress, you wrote a law that says, thou shalt not discriminate on the basis of sex and employment. Surely you meant Lily Ledbetter's case to be covered. My colleagues have given a parsimonious reading to this law, and, and my statement ended, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct what I see as a misperception by my colleagues of the will of Congress. And inside of two years, the Lilly Ledbetter Act passed overwhelmingly bipartisan support, and it was the first law that Obama signed when he took office. This question comes from the auditorium. I had a similar one, which is a number of 5-4 decisions that became very high profile 
Bush versus Gore, Citizens United, and the Affordable Care Act got a lot of popular attention and often were accompanied by commentary that the court was looking like more of a political actor. How do you answer that charge? There inevitably will be cases that will divide uh, that way, but overall, our agreement rate is much higher than our disagreement rate. So we had a 15 five fours last term. We had 25 unanimous judgments. But agreement is boring. Nobody writes about that. Disagreement is interesting. So you're saying agreement is not news, it's boring. It's conflict that gets people's attention. Yes, and, and in the cases where we are, um, the, the cases that are not heady constitutional questions, there are very unusual alliances. But th those, I mean, my disagreement rate is highest with Justice Thomas and, and next with Justice Scalia. But, Last term, Justice Thomas and I agreed in 61% of the cases, and Scalia, 62%. So it's not as though in every case there's the usual suspects, the suspect four and the majority of five. Still, uh, on uh, important questions like campaign finance, we do hold very different views. But we know that this institution, which I think is like no other in the world, is something all of us prize beyond any of our individual egos. So to make it work, we have to be working colleagues, even friends. The Supreme Court is the most collegial place I've ever worked. And I'll give you, well, what you mentioned Bush v. Gore, yes. It was probably the most intense time I was at the court because we granted review of the Florida Supreme Court decision on a Saturday. Briefs were filed Sunday, oral argument on Monday, decisions were out Tuesday night. And there were sharp divisions. It was late at night. I told my clerks to go to Justice Kennedy's chambers and watch the news reports with his clerks. He, he was on the other side. And then I got a call in my chambers, and it's Justice Scalia. And he said, Ruth, why are you still in chambers? Go home and take a hot bath. So as trying as that time was, we had to go on to the January sitting. And we did. Um, and things were almost the same. We have two different questions, one from Kawala College and one from someone here that are very similar. Looking back at all the cases that you've decided, can you pick out the ones that were the most influential and maybe the one that you're most proud of? I'm very proud of my dissent in the healthcare case. I think it, over time it will be influential. And I'm very pleased with the VMI case, which um, I mean, most of the members of the VMI faculty were related because it meant that if they could accept women applicants, they could upgrade their applicant pool and get better <laughs> <laughs> students. <laughs> but when, when people said to me, well, women don't want that kind of rat, what it, what it, what it was called the, the system that they have for the for the first year, 
the rat line. And I said, I wouldn't want it. My daughter and granddaughters wouldn't want it. But there are women who do want that experience. And why should they not have the opportunity? Have you gotten Just as you know how it, it all began. The, the decision that paved the way for VMI was Hogan against Mississippi University for Women. Hogan was a man who wanted to be a nurse. And the Virginia University, uh, Mississippi University for Women had the best nursing college in the area. So he wanted to go to that school. His case came up Justice O'Connor's very first year on the court. It was a five to four decision. She wrote the decision saying that the state college for nurses had to admit men who were qualified. And if you, well, first, when, when I brought that decision home to my husband, he said, Ruth, did you, did you write that? <laughs> um, and second, it was her, her appreciation that there's nothing better you can do for, for a field that historically has been dominantly female is to get more men to be doing the job. Because when men get into the field, pay tends to, <laughs> to go up. So it was that, that you, you asked about male plaintiffs. Well, this was accidental, but it turned out that Hogan's case, trying to get into the women's college, was the principal authority for the women who wanted to attend VMI. Have you gotten letters from women who've since attended VMI? Oh, yes. Uh, and, and from parents of men. And in fact, the, the one I prized most was from a man who, who had graduated from VMI about 10 years before the decision. And he said, in my life, by the way, only 15% of the graduates enter the military. Most of them have business careers in business or in politics. And there was quite an old boy network to help graduates on their way. So this man wrote, in, in, my, in my life, I have met women who are as determined as I am, tougher than I am. Why shouldn't women have that choice? Then some months later, I heard from the same man, and it, the letter enclosed something in tissue paper. I opened it up. It looked like a little tin soldier. Well, the letter said, this is the key debt pin that is given to every mother of VMI graduates. My mother died last week. I think she would want you to have her key debt pin. It's something I, I cherish to this day. So this next question comes from those at Wolf Law. And the question is, what's the greatest threat you can see to our American legal system? Well, the threat that we will be so overcome by security concerns that we will sacrifice the freedom the individual rights that our country has, has stood for, maintaining liberty and freedom in a time of terror is always difficult. And we have made some dreadful mistakes. Think of what happened to people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast in World War II. I think we learn from our mistakes. We won't make that mistake again. But it's, it's not being so overwhelmed by security concerns. Of course, security is important. But our individual rights must be preserved. Otherwise, we're no different from the forces that we're fighting against. How do you feel the? Supreme Court has fared in the terrorism cases it's seen in the last decade? 
I think the court has done pretty well, uh, starting with the government's first position on Guantanamo Bay was Guantanamo Bay is no man's land. It's not part of the United States. After all, we only rent it from Cuba. The majority position was to the extent that law exists in Guantanamo Bay, it is U.S. law. There is no other power. Certainly Castro was not controlling what was happening there. So the, the government has said the writ of habeas corpus doesn't extend to Guantanamo Bay, and we held that, yes, it does, that for that purpose, it was part of the USA. And we've had follow-on cases. There are many cases still in the, in the lower court, so all the returns aren't in. So, the next question is one that I know you never get. What's your view of the nomination process? This comes from Fort Lewis College. And how, if any way, might it be improved um, to make it less, uh, some would say, frustrating or demeaning? It wasn't always the way it has been for the last several nominations, and those would include our Chief Justice, Justice Alito, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan. There were divided votes in all of those cases. People tended to vote along party lines. Contrast that with the way it was when I was nominated in 1993 and Justice Breyer the following year. My biggest supporter on the Senate Judiciary Committee was Senator Orrin Hatch. And he confirmed that in his, he wrote an autobiography in which he takes great pride in the president, President Clinton, having called him before he nominated me and before he nominated Steve Breyer and say, said, Orrin, I'm thinking of nominating Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and Hatch said that they, they would be okay for him. <laughs> Wasn't prepared to say okay to Bruce Babbitt, but okay for Ginsburg and, and Breyer. But it was that bipartisan spirit. You know, it was, it, the, the hearings ran over three days, but there were no hardball questions. So the senators were mostly using me to speak through me to their constituents to show how caring they were, how well-informed they were. <laughs> they spent a lot more time talking than I, than, than I did. The White House was very concerned about my ACLU connection. You know, I had helped to launch the Women's Rights Project and been one of four general counsel for seven years. There wasn't a single question, not a single question, about my ACLU affiliation. That would not have happened in recent years. I think what it will take is great statesmen on both sides of the aisle. And I, this is not the fault of one party rather than the other. I mean, it really started with Bob Bork when it was the Democrats um, who prevented his confirmation. And then the, the over 30 negative votes on someone as superbly qualified as Elena Kagan, it will take great people on both sides of the aisle to come together and say, enough, this is not the way we should be, we should be approving judges. If a person is devoted to the law and can do the hard work that's involved, um, that's what should count. There was a great man who said that the true symbol of the United States is not the bald eagle, it is the pendulum. So I hope that the pendulum will swing back to the way it was in 93 and 94. In one hopeful sign, 
Dick Durbin Center from Illinois, the, I think the um, number two uh, person in the Senate, the um, majority leader, said that um, he thought Lindsey Graham had it right, which is that there should be some deference to the president. Lindsey Graham was one of the few Republicans yeah. who voted for Elena Kagan, and he regretted mm -hmm. voting against Roberts and Alito mm -hmm. on that principle. So mm -hmm. your hope may, we'll see, have some traction. The last question will come from an alum in the audience, which is, although I'll reserve the right to ask a follow-up question okay. to this one. <laughs> what qualities should Colorado Law School be focusing on as we train the next generation of lawyers? What? Qualities. A law degree gives you a license in a sense, a kind of a monopoly on the practice of law. Law is supposed to be a learned profession. If you are a member of a learned profession, you are not satisfied with merely turning over a buck. You know you have something special, and you owe it to your community to use your talent to help make things a little better for others. I think a lawyer who commits herself to public service, yes, can make a living that's necessary, but also to remember the people who desperately need rep representation and will not have it unless you care. So I do not think someone who says, I'll do my job and I will collect my fees and I'm not interested in the rest of the world. I, I do not consider that person a true professional. We'll do our best. <laughs> I can't thank you enough. This has been delightful and a treat for everyone here. Let's all thank you for your time. <laughs>